But there are really three essential points I want to make. I want to talk about the programmatic and other costs, the effects that the cuts already made and the cuts in prospect uh, will mean for people in uniform and for the Defense Department. I want to try to imagine what the effect of those cuts would be and the diminished capabilities that would result on a very dangerous world. And then I really want to pivot a little bit to talk about the politics of trying to keep the, keeping the worst from, from happening. Uh, along with uh, uh, the Heritage Foundation and the Foreign Policy Initiative, uh, AI has been doing a project for the past year that very much parallels what Frank is now doing and what I would really encourage everybody in this room to get engaged with because the time is really short. Super Committee reports out before Thanksgiving, six weeks or so away, two months away. Um, and the process uh, is not going to be pretty. It's going to be brief. It's not going to have very much time for reflection. It's not even clear that it's going to be an open and transparent process. As of now, there's no provision, and we heard from Senator Kyle yesterday, who's a member of the Joint Committee, uh, there's no provision to have a hearing, for example, at which Secretary Panetta and General Dempsey would be asked to testify and explain what the implications of sequestration or cuts that amount to the same thing, or yet even the cuts that have already been taken uh, would be. I, I think that's just negligent and criminal, and I can't say enough bad about it. If this process happens without officials hearing from the people who are directly responsible for our national security, what the implications of this would be, that would be a travesty of democratic and representative government. But without a groundswell, that people becoming engaged, and we saw yesterday, I'll give you a summary of what our event was yesterday that we had in the Rayburn building to, to conclude. And read some of the quotes from across a, a spectrum of conservative politicians, senior legislators like Senator Kyle, uh, Randy Forbes uh, from the House Armed Services Committee, Lindsey Graham, uh, but also young Republicans like Alan West, Kelly Ayotte, uh, and Duncan Hunter. To think that the Reagan legacy is diminishing in the Republican Party uh, I think is entirely wrong, but it needs now to be heard uh, as strongly as ever, again, because really the time is now. So I want to begin by talking a little bit about the, the chart that I gave you. And this is a situational wild ass guess, but it's an informed one and it's one uh, that results from my own work, uh, work by people in industry, work by people in the Pentagon, work by people in other think tanks, uh, and I think uh, uh, that the numbers essentially will speak for themselves. There's, just to review the bidding, since Barack Obama became president, there have been three serious rounds of defense cuts. One taken in 2009 that resulted in $330 billion worth of programs, procurement programs being terminated, things like the F-22, the Army's future combat system, uh, the Navy's uh, Zumwalt destroyer. A couple years ago, uh, the, uh, the small fry that slipped through the net got cut, things like the Marines' expeditionary fighting vehicle. Secretary Gates identified about $100 billion worth of efficiencies. That is, he was able to move $100 billion around within the defense program. But another $78 billion was, was cut. And of that $100 billion, $25 billion was used to pay for unfunded war costs. So the, cost, the cut in 2010 was another $100 billion. The Deficit Reduction Act that was just passed, resulting in the cut drill that the Pentagon is now undergoing, 
actually the dollar cost keeps rising, but I heard from a service undersecretary the other day that the figure has reached something like $425 billion. This is an administration official describing what his job is. And, of course, there's the super committee process, which has, uh, in the form of the sequestration provision, a large caliber weapon pointed again at the head of the Pentagon that could result in another $600 billion worth of defense cuts. Secretary Panetta, once a liberal Democrat from California, described this as unacceptable. General Dempsey, in his confirmation hearing, using the sort of anodyne words that Joint Chiefs use, described what would result as a very high-risk situation. And I'll talk a bit in a minute about what that might mean. Because that's, there's no risk meter that you can dial back there are things that happen in the world and enemies who take advantage of our weakness. But just to go through what the effects of these last, of the last cut just taken and, and the implications, you know, the numbers being run now in the Pentagon and what the law would call for. And also, I don't know how you guys reacted to the president's speech last night, but when I hear him talking about finding another $500 billion worth of stimulus and looking to advance a more ambitious deficit reduction program, I, I get a little bit sweaty about what that too is going to mean for defense cuts. Obviously, the president was a little light on details last night, uh, but, and we'll see what happens in a week or so when he advances his plan. Uh, but uh, I, I would look to see how he intends to pay for it or intends to pass the bogey uh, to the Congress to fund his uh, second stimulus program. Mm -hmm. But what we're looking at, I think, and again, I think this is just in the numbers, and I'm going to quickly run through it. The most certain cut is likely to be in the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter program, if only because that's where the money is. If you look at the recent Pentagon Selected Acquisition Reports, it's an order of the money left to complete the program, which has itself been reduced a lot from the original plan, is nearly ten times what any other single program has. We have put all our eggs in this basket over the last generation, and it's the last big basket that's out there. It's essential to the Air Force, it's essential to the Navy, and it's completely essential to the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps uh, is going to be reduced to essentially shipborne infantry. They've lost the expeditionary fighting vehicle, which in addition to conveying them from ship to shore at faster than two knots an hour, gave them some firepower and mobility ashore. And if they lose the B version of the F-35, you can't fly a carrier version uh, of the F-35 from a re marine amphibious vehicle. On the other hand, without a replacement for the Harrier, the value of a big deck marine amphib is severely diminished. So the F-35 is really right in the center of the bullseye. And without that capability, without that fifth generation fighter capability, our ability to respond to Chinese provocation or to do something serious in the event of a conflict or a crisis with Iran, for example, or North Korea or Pakistan or anything that requires high technology conventional firepower is going to be severely diminished. That, but that's just really the beginning of the story, and I'll quickly go through this. We hardly have a nuclear triad today, but we won't have one for very long. We may not even have one that survives the cuts that are already in place. And what that will mean, I don't know. But with nu the w nuclear world we're looking at, where more people have more nuclear weapons, where everyone is building nuclear weapons except for us, 
Everybody is modernizing their nuclear capabilities except for us. The point is that we don't know what we're getting into. It's not the old bipolar Cold War competition. It's a multipolar, multilateral game, multi-sided game with people. If we thought the Soviets were unpredictable and thought very differently about nuclear weapons than we did, how can we imagine what the Chinese or the Iranians or the Pakistanis or the Saudis would regard their nuclear capabilities once they have them? American conventional military power over the last generation has first and foremost been about the value of tactical aircraft. American air, air power is the signature form of American conventional military power. But that's been gutted and is going to be gutted a second time if these cuts go through. By my best guess, the Air Force tactical air capability is essentially uh, uh, going to be uh, diminished by at least a third, possibly more, and it'll be far less modern. The Air Force is already talking about extending the life of F-16s and F-15s and cutting its F-35 by. I don't see how we can keep a 10 or 11 carrier battle group force. There just won't be the money available. Of course, we have 50 years of carriers in supply already. We were intending to uh, employ these ships for decades and decades to come. But there will neither be the sailors to man them, the airplanes to fly off them, or the money to steam them and operate them. Again, the Marine Corps strikes me as being especially uh, uh, at risk, too. It's likely to be reduced well below pre-9-11 numbers to something like 150,000. Likely also the U.S. Army, which we've had to expand uh, and finally did expand uh, in the surge in 2007 in Iraq, is already, as is the Marine Corps, planned to be reduced to the 9-11 numbers. But if these cuts go through, it's very difficult to see how the active duty Army remains above 400,000 people mm -hmm. and how the number of brigade combat teams uh, isn't reduced by at least a third. It's also clear that our overseas posture, which is the key to our ability to project power in the world, whatever one thinks of the lib operation, it would not have been operationally possible without bases in southern Europe. The carriers that we might have used to conduct that campaign, and again, I'm strictly talking about the conduct of the campaign, not the wisdom of the campaign, but the carrier that was deployed was in the Red Sea providing combat air patrols over Afghanistan. It took two weeks to transit from the Red Sea through the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean. And of course, the really important aircraft, the tankers, uh, the uh, surveillance aircraft, wouldn't have been on an aircraft carrier anyway. They needed to have a land based, land base to operate out of. And that's true of our perimeter across the world. Our position in Japan and Korea, absolutely essential to our posture in East Asia. To places in the South China Sea, like the Philippines, who are begging us to return because they feel the heat of Chinese pressure in those waters. Even the Vietnamese, once our greatest enemy, would be willing to open their facilities to American forces and so on and so forth around the world. We can't get to the Middle East without stopping for gas in Germany. Without the hospitals in Germany to give high quality surgical care to casualties from Iraq and Afghanistan, you can bet that hundreds more Americans would have died over the past 10 years. If those facilities go away, there is going to be a cost. And finally, we're not going to save any money. The only way you save money from that kind of withdrawal is to take the units out of the order of battle. To bring them home requires building new facilities at places all over the continental United States. The few bases that we've, and we've had an immense amount of contraction in our base posture. 
places like Fort Hood are pretty full. It's a big place, but you'd have to build more barracks, more facilities, more training ranges, so on and so forth, and particularly the training ranges, of which there are a, a fraction of, of the former facilities that we used to have, because of, not only because of budget cuts, but of environmental regulations and things like that. The National Training Center in the desert in California maneuvers have to stop when the turtles want to cross the road. I'm not making that up. Quickly to talk about, and, and I invite anyone to participate in imagining what the retraction of American military power would mean for the world. Is the world likely to be less dangerous and safer than it is today? Play, you know, play in Europe, for example, where we spent a, a century, an immense amount of treasure and blood to create a stable peace after centuries of warfare, you know, remaining there and keeping the peace requires very little effort. But in the Middle East, or in East Asia, or in the Indian Ocean, or in South Asia, can anybody seriously predict peace and stability absent American influence and power? We can talk about that more in the Q&A. Finally, I really want to talk about the politics. This is where the conservative movement, I believe, will define itself as to the, what kind of conservatives we are. For Reagan conservatives, peace through strength was the number one you know, the, the, the prime directive. And the purpose of government, the constitutional purpose of government, was to protect America and its security interests. And we really do face a moment where we stare into the abyss. So I just want to read a couple of quotes from people who made presentations yesterday. Because it strikes me that the Reaganite heart of the conservative movement is still vital and strong. Senator Kyle said he would quit the super committee if there were further defense cuts. I know, I've known John Kyle for a long time. He's a very cautious, uh, you know, sober guy. He's not a guy who goes out in the public and throws down ultimatums. But yesterday, he said that if there were further defense cuts, any further defense cuts in this process, he would walk. Really out of character for Senator Kyle. Senator Lindsey Graham, also, you know, a plain spoken guy, uh, but not exactly, uh, you know, a flamethrower. Let me just read his quote. He said, this pisses me off beyond belief that our party would subject the Department of Defense, not just to more cuts, but to the end of the finest force we have ever, or ever created in the history of the world. This budget deal is a philosophical shift that I will have no part of. And he specifically cited the Reaganite roots of the, conservative, the modern conservative movement. Alan West, who has bigger or greater sort of new conservative or Tea Party credentials than Alan West? Uh, essentially, uh, very much uh, said the same thing. And he said, I think quite rightly, we have to go back and start developing a strategy first before we start looking to the military and basing the military upon the budget, which is really essentially what's happened for 25 years in the post-Cold War. Budget first, strategy second or basing the military upon numbers. Senator Kelly Ayotte was there. We cannot thoughtlessly slash defense and create a national security crisis on top of the economic crisis. Randy Forbes, the final myth is this, that we can make these kind of drastic cuts without a substantial risk to our future, and on and on and on. I couldn't have, it was a staff person's dream, uh, you know. Keeping members of Congress on script is not easy to do, but these guys were speaking from conviction, 
with a very sophisticated analysis, I would say these guys knew the facts of the case extremely well. But when they contemplated the future, they were unanimous in saying no more. And my hope would be that from the Congress, and particularly from Republicans and conservatives and <laughs> those few defense Democrats who are hiding in their foxholes, uh, that the first priorities of the government will be not how much we spend, but what we spend the taxpayers' money on. And uh, if we don't look to our security first, um, it's not likely that we'll have economic prosperity, nor peace, nor liberty.